Hello everyone, it's the 28th of October, so it's time to review Arachnids in the UK. So, Rosa last week was a very unusual episode for Doctor Who. In order to balance that, we get a very traditional episode in the form of Arachnids in the UK. And I think this episode does a really great job. To start off with, it introduces us to Yaz's family, her sister Sonia, her dad Hakim, and her mum Naja, who, of the family, gets the most to do in this story. I do think that the other two members of the family are a little underused, because we introduce the idea that Hakim's a bad cook. We, we get the, the Doctor's really hilarious attempts at small talk. I just love the bit where she picks up on how Yaz says that her dad's Pecori is terrible, and so the Doctor describes it in exactly the same way, but in that really friendly tone that I mentioned back in The Woman Who Fell to Earth. But there's, there's no real payoff from that. There's no kind of, Yaz, where did you go? <laughs> they don't turn up at the hotel with the food. But I suppose that's, that's possibly a little, bit, a little bit more something Russell T Davies might do. Instead, this family is a bit subtler, and I feel very well observed. You know, I believe particularly the relationship between Yaz and Sonia, and it gives Yaz a little bit to do. The first time around watching the season, I felt Yaz was a bit underused. But in these first four episodes, she has got a decent share of what's going on. And here, of course, she's the first character of the regulars to go into the danger of the hotel. And of course in the hotel we have Chris Knopf as Jack Robertson. And I think he's a really well written and very well played character. He's an obvious Donald Trump analogue and the plot lampshades that by mentioning that he is a rival of Donald Trump. Despite the sort of early horribleness of the character, and the way he speaks to Frankie and Kevin, and of course he fires Naja the second he sees her, he is given sympathetic moments as the story goes on, and I think that's very important. In response to last week's review, one of you lovely viewers out there, Petty Tyrant, did bring up that Crasco felt a bit sort of two-dimensional and could have done with a bit more depth. Now, Jack Robertson does have some more depth here. I think what the difference is, there is leeway in the character of Jack Robertson to ask us to feel some sympathy for him as a character. The temptation would have been to present him as a businessman who cares exclusively for profit and not for people at all. But he does show some emotion when he discovers Frankie and Kevin's bodies. And one could even think that his later actions, which the Doctor objects to, are partly a response to that. I think the reason we don't get that with Crasco last week is that the story is very clearly and very rightly saying that racism is wrong. There can be no justification for what Crasco does. And that's why he's an out-and-out -out villain. Jack Robertson is... he is a villain, but as he points out, he, while ultimately responsible for the situation, did not set out to create this situation. I do hope we see him again. I hope we see him again as a presidential candidate next series, or possibly even president, and that the Doctor is a bit stronger in her dealing with him. But at the same time, what is she going to do at the end of this story, aside from let him walk away? He has plausible deniability for what has created this situation, and really all he's done is kill a giant spider, which the authorities are probably going to say, yeah, good job, mate. It may be unsatisfying to us to not see him get his comeuppance, and I really hope that the series is setting him up for a bigger fall later on. Now, as for Team TARDIS, as they're dubbed at the end of this story, I think everyone gets a good share of the action. We get a little bit more of the plot of Graham and Ryan. Will Ryan accept Graham as family? And we almost get there. <laughs> when they discover a giant spider. So it's kind of like Graham and Ryan's relationship keeps getting put on hold because of being involved with the Doctor. Oh, and we get the scenes with Graham and Grace, you know, his imagined Grace and what Grace might think. And it's a new and interesting meditation on grief that the series, 
I don't think has done much like this before. You know, when, when Clara dies, the Twelfth Doctor kind of imagines her, we do get that. But this is very different because this is a human character, you know, so we expect him to have this grief. And of course, it's wonderful to see Sharon D. Clark again. But I just cry in those scenes still. It really took me by surprise because, of course, I cried last year when it was new. But this year I was expecting it and I thought, oh, yeah, it's not going to bother me that much. But no, it's really affecting. And the director, Sally Abrahamian, and Sally, I apologise if I mispronounced your surname, but she does an amazing, amazing job with this story. When we first see Grace, she's in the background out of focus. We're just focused on Graham. And the more he talks to her, the more she comes into focus until finally at the end, you know, we're fully seeing her. Chris Chibnall's script writing can sometimes be a bit on the nose and people tell you exactly how they're feeling in a way they wouldn't in real life. But instead, these scenes with Graham and Grace, what I get from that is Graham is mulling over whether he should stay in the house, stay with Grace, or go out and adventure. And she kind of tells him, you know, what staying in the house would entail. You've got to change the vacuum bags and this is when the bins go out and seems to be silently encouraging him, no, go off and have your adventures. And I also like that Graham acknowledges that he is going to grieve, but he chooses how to grieve. And both Graham and Ryan have commented in the last few episodes that Grace would have liked to be along for the ride, and in a way she gets to be through the two of them. It's, it's subtlety from a writer who is not always subtle. And I think it's really well done. The spider CG is top notch. I cannot believe how good these spiders look. And <laughs> in my relationship, I am the designated spider remover. And I do talk to them soothingly when I am trying to remove them from the house. You know, take away container or a glass over the top, put a card under the bottom, exactly how Ryan and Graham catch the spider in the, um, in the hotel. So when the doctor is talking to the spiders and saying, you know, I'm really sorry this has happened to you, but I'm going to sort it out. It's an important reminder to us how spiders are part of our natural world and our natural ecosystem. It's important to have them in the right place and in the right scale, I should point out. But that's the thing. The Doctor's not just, I'm going to kill these things. This Doctor respects life no matter which form it takes. I have no doubt that if these had ended up being the spiders from Metabolus 3 trying to invade Earth, the Doctor would have taken stronger measures but instead they are innocent creatures which have been caught up in a situation not of their own making. There's a moth in here. <laughs> How appropriate. Now that brings us to the character who I think is the weak link in the story, and that is Dr. Jade McIntyre, played by Tanya Fear. I just find her performance really one note. You know, whether she's talking about her colleague who she's worried about, or the experiments she's doing in her lab, or confronting Jack Robertson about dumping the waste incorrectly. There's no levels to the performance. She's just always on that single level. And it's not a bad level. It's not a bad performance. But I just feel it's lacklustre. Whereas Naja is a very subtle character, but gets a lot of variation into her performance. It's really interesting to see that Tanya Fear and Shobna Galati have a similar method of delivery, but Shobna just manages to get more nuance and more emotion into it. Back on the topic of Shobna and Mandip, again, they give me a believable mother-daughter relationship. And what I find most intriguing about this is that Naja asks both the Doctor and Ryan, if they're involved with Yaz. And I wonder if at some point we might get the revelation that Yaz is bisexual. Because to her mother, the idea of both or either seems very natural. And that could give us the queer representation the show is uh, slightly misfiring on, because again, we murder a queer character in this story. Frankie, of course, is the wife of Jack Robertson's niece. 
she's quite likeable and of course gets a very traditional Doctor Who screaming death like Kevin does. I'm aware that a queer character is not the only character who dies in the story, but so far it's just, it's a little bit awkward. <laughs> I love that Ryan is the one who lures the spiders in using Stormzy. You know, it's a wonderful modern touch. And again, it gives Tosin Cole a chance to light up. So all of the regulars get something to do in this. The Doctor gets some morality about the spiders. And until a gun gets pulled out, we have a non-lethal solution. The spiders are going to die, but they're going to die a natural death as... Jade says, you know, it's the best, it's kind of the best we can do for them, although they are just going to keep growing in that space and that could be unpleasant. I give Arachnids in the UK 8 out of 10. Really, I'm just deducting points for slightly underusing Yaz's family, for Tanya Fear's performance that needed to be a bit stronger, and the ambiguity surrounding Jack Robertson at the end. I get why they did it, I just would have liked a bit more steel from the Doctor confronting Jack Robertson like we saw with Crasco last week. That's it for this review. Do come back tomorrow for Say Something Nice and thank you so much for watching.